Crow here. I know Charlie's been through a lot and he's wrestled with the idea of leaving the church and going elsewhere, but uh, I for one appreciate you coming early and getting things going. It makes my job so much easier. And you know, there's a lot of people that do things in the background. As a matter of fact, all of us do things in the background. And it's just nice to have a pat on the back and say, at a boy, you know. Those things notice are notice and God notices all those things. You know, when you go that extra mile, because the Bible says we don't work for man, really. Who do we work for, Sam? We work for God. We work for him. So even though your earthly taskmaster may be a jerk, maybe your earthly husband in their life is not where they need to be, but we're doing all things unto the Lord. Our service is consecrated to the Lord. So when we were singing, we exalt thee, we lift up, we magnify, we elevate the name of Jesus. Our labors are unto him. And we are servants, aren't we? Okay. doesn't matter what a, a position we have or what title we have or what alphabet we have after our name. As Ronnie kind of was alluding to this morning, when you stand before Christ, we stand before him naked. We don't have anybody else being our advocate except Jesus Christ. And you know what? He's more than enough if you are on Christ's side. For he is our advocate who will stand before. And you know what? I've been in court several times and will be in court again. I'd much rather have Jesus be my defense attorney than anybody else. Amen. As you open your Bibles, we're going to be going to the book of Isaiah. Heavenly Father, I thank you for an opportunity to open your word. Not only open it, but to read and to allow your spirit to bring understanding. For you have the spirit of wisdom and you have the spirit of understanding, not just knowledge. God, we don't seek simple knowledge. God, we seek an understanding of the divine. God, we recognize that our image of you is somehow tainted, somehow less than what you truly are. And God, I pray as we read and study and contemplate and meditate upon your word that you would reveal more of who you are. Lord, as we look at the prophecies that Isaiah has brought forth and we recognize them that they have been fulfilled largely. And God, that for us that are waiting the return of the Messiah as our King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as we are waiting to be taken as your body and bride, we recognize that it's imminent. Nothing need more happen that all the prophecies that need to be fulfilled for the church have been fulfilled. I thank you for your continued outpouring of your spirit. For your spirit brings life. The law brings death. We thank you that we have been redeemed and we have been set free by the spirit of life. And God, I pray that your words would become rhema in our hearing. Not merely logos as written word, but God, as the spoken word comes and it begins to move within our being, it begins to have its effect, the effect that you desire it to have. Lord, as we come to you with humility, as you, we come to you broken, as we come to you recognizing we need your word to be alive in us. God, I pray that we would take away all hindrances so that you will truly have your way in us in Jesus name. Amen. Now, as we've been studying about the judgments of God in the book of Isaiah, we recognize that Israel, his beloved, the apple of his eye, had transgressed to the point that they had largely ignored the Holy One of Israel. And the word is Kadosh Yisrael, means holy is the God of Israel. And Israel had gotten to a point where they've gotten lazy. They've gotten to a point where they don't want to meet on Sunday nights anymore. They don't want to meet on Wednesday nights anymore. They don't want to go through the oblations anymore. This group is a group of overcomers. This group is here, despite the church saying we don't have corporate worship on Sundays. Well, we do. Wherever a group is gathered in the name of Jesus, there is worship that will ensue. And there hopefully will be his spirit moving with us. And it's not about a bunch of opinions. But as we open this word, what does he promise in? That it will have an effect. And the effect that this word has is the effect that he wants. 
but we need to be willing subjects, don't we? We have to have ears that are sharpened and attuned for his still small voice. Now, last night in our get together, we were studying chapter 10 of Isaiah, and I want to finish with the very end. God says about the Assyrian army that God was using as his rod or his staff of correction. So God was using an evil empire, the Assyrians, to come in and to punish Israel. Now I want you to understand this happened in 740 to 720 BC. Okay? Now through Isaiah, God said it's not just going to be the Assyrian army. The Assyrian army came from the north conquered and came all the way down to remember that three letter word where they came out on the outskirts knob came to knob and it was there god had prophesied that not an arrow would be shot in jerusalem and jerusalem would not know destruction of the assyrians and god stopped them right on the outskirts called knob n-o-b so right on the outskirts of jerusalem god fulfilled his prophecy exactly okay big surprise isn't it and after that, some hundred years later, we're now at 600 BC, we have the Babylonians that came in. And the Babylonians didn't stop at Nob, did they? What did the Babylonians do? They came in and they conquered Jerusalem. And matter of fact, in 596, they destroyed the walls of the temple. They destroyed Jerusalem, turned it upside down. God kept warning them that Israel wasn't listening. I hope that we are a little wiser than that. As God begins to shake and he begins to rumble, as he's sending peals from thunder, or, or peals of lightning and, and thunderous noises from heaven that we're hearkening under his word. He's wanting us to understand his correction. He's wanting us to repent. It's the bottom line. America needs to be under judgment for her, her sins are many. We now, I mean, any of you that have a little bit of gray hair on your head wreck, never would have believed we would be celebrating gay and lesbian marriage. Never. I mean, we were kids. We never thought about that. Matter of fact, when we were kids, the year 2000, the millennium seemed like a long time away. And I remember sitting in school thinking I'd never see the millennium, that I'm going to die before then. Well, I guess that didn't work out, did it? <laughs> Live longer than I thought. And so... I recognize that we're in this time period where it's almost like we're all just holding our breath, waiting for the appearance of the King of Kings, and at the same time wondering how much worse can our country and our world get? Yeah. And the reality is it will. We've already been prophesied it's going to get worse. Ronnie mentioned as in the days of Noah. We weren't there in the days of Noah, but we got a recording of some of it that out of the probably million people that were on that small area of the earth and this is before the great flood do you know that before the great flood the earth's landmass was together that was before it broke apart okay where we you, you can go back and put australia there in 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 africa and tuck it in then you could take north america and south america and central america and bring it over it was all one large landmass but after the great floods earthquakes, big divides, and the land masses began to separate. So we understand we can't really be racist because we're all one race. We're all human beings creating an image of likeness of God spiritually. And we all have different levels of melatonin in our or um, excuse me, melanin in our skin. So some have darker skin, some have lighter skin. People have taken that since the dawn of man and thinks it's a curse on God if you have darker skin or you're better if you have whiter skin. That's all nonsense. But now we've come this country that Christians now are being persecuted. The ones that are trying to be the servants of all, the ones who are trying to walk in humble servitude of their Lord, we're the ones being persecuted. And you know what? It's going to get worse, Sandy. You're correct. So let's learn a little bit about that. God says there will be retribution. He said to these Assyrians that God used as a tool and they thought it was all themselves. We did this ourselves. Matter of fact, we came in and we plucked eggs out, out of like an abandoned nest and the mama didn't even chirp, the daddy didn't even chirp. In other words, we came in, it was easy to conquer. 
what the Assyrian army said. And God says in chapter 10 of Isaiah, verse 33, See the Lord, the Lord Almighty will lop off the boughs, that is the main branches or what boughs are, with great power. And the lofty trees will be felled. The tall ones will be brought low. And he will cut down the forest thickets with an axe. Lebanon will fall before the mighty one. And God says, you think you're this big forest of trees and that you're untouchable. That nothing can come against you. But I am going to cut you as with an axe. Now, there's something unspoken but is revealed here if you think about it. Since I was cutting trees yesterday, when you fell a tree with an axe, what's left behind? A stump. A stump. I want you to think about that. Because when you cut that vibrant living tree as the sap flows and it branches out, and when the tree is mature, if it's a fruit tree, what do you hope it produces? Fruit. fruit. And aren't we relegated to being like a tree that should be producing fruit? Okay. So if you cut the tree, and the choicest portions, the main branches fall to the ground and get consumed. What's left is a stump. Do you get fruit from a stump? No. no. So as a matter of fact, in Alabama, if you cut a tree five years ago and you still got a stump, what do you, how do you consider the stump? Useless. useless. It's actually more than useless. It's actually rotten. rotten. A what? Decayed. Decayed. But more importantly to a farmer, what? It's a nuisance. It's a nuisance. A farmer trying to walk, <clears throat> trip over the stump. Trump is, does it have live branches coming out of the stump? Is something regrowing in the stump? No, it's a dead, useless thing that's become a burden. Okay? So that's why they have stump grinders, and that's why they have all these other techniques to try to trip. You know, in Alabama, they're going to burn it out. Right? Pour diesel on it, burn it out. You know, get rid of the stump. Now, I want you to be thinking towards the stump. All right? Because look what God's going to do. Chapter 11, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Boom. Does that mean anything to anybody? From his roots, a branch will do what? Bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and of power, and a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in. In the fear of the Lord. Stumps appear dead. They don't bear fruit. But the prophecy here is that the royal lineage of David, which at that point of this writing had laid dormant and inactive for 600 years. So how many stumps remain in your field for 600 years? Because you already told me that it was going to be rotten and decayed. But out of this seemingly dead, rotten stump of 600 years, God will bring up a royal lineage. And he didn't say from the house of David, because that would have given him a big name. But this stump is going to be a humble stump. This stump is going to come as a servant, because it's coming from the root of Jesse, who is the father of David. Not many people know Jesse, do they? But they all know King David. But nobody wants to talk about Jesse. And so, what does that allude to? Humility. If you would have said, comes from the lineage of David, you went, oh, royalty. Oh, a royal line. When you say Jesse, it's kind of like, oh, Jesse. Uh, he had a bunch of boys, right? It's a humble way to come, isn't he? Now, the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Now, in Revelation, we find the term, the sevenfold Spirit of God, or the seven spirits of God. Now, there's not seven Holy Spirits, right? Seven in this aspect means what? It's a number of what, baby? Com perfection. It's a number of perfection. Okay? Can't get any more perfect than that. And so the Spirit of God just doesn't have seven functions. But in this is a sevenfold spirit, the Spirit of the Lord. And, and again, life is brought by the Spirit. My words are, didn't you say, my words are Spirit. They're life. They bring life, okay? So we have the Spirit of the Lord. And then we have three sets of two. Spirit of wisdom and understanding. Spirit of counsel and power. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Now I want you to think of the menorah. Do you all know about the Hebrew menorah, the Jewish menorah? You have a main trunk. 
comes from a stump and the main shaft rises just like a tree trunk and off of that comes branches and there's six in it one two three on this side one two three on this side and then the main one in the middle so it's a total of seven okay so here we have three sets of two and the main trunk of the tree so you've got seven now somebody turn to first corinthians 1 verse 30. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. So Christ is what? Wisdom. So we have the spirit of the Lord resting in the spirit of wisdom. In the spirit of understanding, out of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. In other words, he's been tested and he's been proven. In other words, does Christ have understanding of what we're going through? Yeah. Yes, he does. So he has the spirit of understanding. Yet he did all this without sin, as we talked about this morning. Okay? And we have a spirit of counsel. If Christ is wisdom, and he understands where we're at and what we're going through, does that not qualify him to be a counselor to us? Absolutely. Well, how come we keep chasing after man in his opinion then? We've got a far better counselor right here. We don't need to go in and be told we're nothing but an addict or we're nothing but a pervert or we're nothing but this or we're nothing but bipolar or we're nothing but schizophrenic. You know what? The great counselor would tell us a different report that you can be delivered because he has healing in his hand. And he is the spirit of might or the spirit of power. If you want real power, power to overcome, power to change your situation, it doesn't come through who gets elected on November the 8th, does it? Real power is in the hands of the Lord God Almighty. Power is left on loan temporarily. And we have power from Christ. And we talk about descending out of the disciples this morning. That we came forth and we have power to even make the demons submit. But how do we do it? Because we're special. Because we have just this innate power. Because it's by the humanity that does it. No, what is it? It's all in Jesus' name. So it's power that's on loan from Christ. Because who are the demons afraid of? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. They know Jesus and they tremble. Now, if we know Jesus and we're full of Jesus and we're reflecting Jesus, guess what? We'll set hell of fear. It'll be fearful of us because we get it. We understand the power doesn't emanate with us and in our humanity, but from without us that comes within and spills out in an overflow because Christ is overflowing in us a wellspring of living water. And where there is that wellspring, there is teeming with life. It's his power and his authority. And now there is a spirit of knowledge. Knowledge is a good thing if it's used correctly. Every time the Pharisees had a question for Jesus to trap him, Jesus came through it smelling like a rose, didn't he? And the Pharisees came out with egg on their face, thinking they were going to trap somebody who has supreme knowledge. You're not going to trap Jesus. Doesn't work. Even the devil tried his crafty wiles, even when Jesus was weak physically in the body after 40 days of fasting, right? Didn't work, did it? Away from me, Satan. And the fear of the Lord. Now I want you to understand, fear of the Lord implies a humble submission. Isn't that what Ronnie was talking about this morning? We need to become more humble, in a submitted state to God's authority. In verse 3, it says, And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. If we go to John chapter 4, verse 32. John 4, 32 says it this way. But he said to them, I have food to eat. That you know nothing about. What kind of food was Jesus feeding on? He was feeding on spiritual food. Okay? But the disciples still hadn't got it. Jesus has the kind of fear of the Lord that he understands his place and that God would take care of him. 
And so he was feeding on directly from the Father. Now, if we can feed on Jesus, Jesus is our advocate. And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you have me, you also have Father. Remember how he explained that to Thomas? So how do we go through it? How do we get to the Father? Through Jesus the Christ. And as we go on in, in verse 3, it says, He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. You know what? When you see things and hear things, it's, all, it's only in your own vantage point, isn't it? If you're right here and somebody sees and hears from over there, they may have a different perspective, just like in a car accident. You have several opinions about what really went on in a car accident. Depends on your vantage point. Oh, well, you didn't see the deer, or you didn't see the other car, or you didn't see the motorcycle. Well, there was no motorcycle. Yeah, it was. You couldn't see it. But it says, God will not judge merely by his sight or by his ears. What's it say? But with righteousness, he will judge the needy with justice. He will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Do you think God is concerned about justice being done? Now that word, but with righteousness, let me put in a different phrase. Accurate vindication. Does that mean anything to you? That means God judges rightly. There's no argument with his judging. Okay? And Ronnie kind of alluded that to this morning. You can kick and spit and cuss and fuss all you want, but his word's truth. His word is eternal and he judges righteously. I'd rather stand before the Lord and know that he is not going to misunderstand or miscommunicate that it's going to be done with accuracy. And those that need to be vindicated will be vindicated. It's not for me to seek vindication. Whose is it? It's God's. That's God's job. Okay. He will vindicate. He will uplift those who have been mistreated. And if we've learned anything in Isaiah is God stands for those who are poor, who are getting oppressed by those who are rich and have means and are taking advantage of them. Now, who's more poor and oppressed than anybody else? As a matter of fact, they're still in the womb. Unborn babies that Hillary Rodham Clinton says have no rights and they can be murdered even up to the day they're born. Do you think God's okay with that? Okay. So I can't tell people who to vote for, but I can tell you that right there, when God says it's detestable in my sight, I can't vote for somebody like that. I, I can't even, I can't even understand their thinking. After 21 years in ob I, I can't imagine murdering your baby right after you deliver it. But these people are doing it up to the day of delivering, just taking and murdering their unborn children that now get born. It's just unbelievable how... And those who make those decisions have already been born. You know, the unborn doesn't get to cry out. It's those who have been born that make that decision. Think about it. So let's, let's move on. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. What do you think that speaks to? Anybody. Come on. There's power in his word. Because I just said his word is what? His word's truth. His word's truth. How are you going to argue with the truth? You could say, I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that's true. You know what? The truth isn't offended whether you believe it or not because it's still true. All right? The truth isn't wrong. <laughs> the truth, by the very nature of the truth, is correct, right? So I want you to think about this. That he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Now, in the battle of Megiddo, in the area called Armageddon, something comes forth from the mouth of the Lord. What is it? It's a sword. And what's that sword going to do? It's going to kill it's going to destroy all those who say that's not true. And what do you think the sword is? It's the word of God. Okay? And so this is, that's what this is referring to. That the rod of his mouth is the same thing as a sword to come from his mouth. It's the eternal truth. Because isn't Christ the living word? In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Okay? Jesus is the embodiment of the living word. You can't argue with it. And it says the breath of his lips... 
He will slay the wicked. And I want you to understand, breath is ruach in the Hebrew. And in the Greek, it's pneuma. Okay? That's the Spirit. That's the Spirit of God. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 says it this way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Y'all getting a picture here? We're not going to have to fight that battle, are we? Christ is going to do it, and he's merely going to speak the truth. And at this time, the truth is going to hit like a sledgehammer, and it's going to destroy any in its path. I don't want to be on the wrong side of the truth. Verse 5, righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. In other words, Christ is nothing but righteous. He's nothing but full of justice and full of faithfulness. And he wears them like a belt. Okay? They're, they're that close to his heart. Now, what do you think he's referring to, Isaiah, when he says the wolf will live with the lamb and the leopard will die, lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, the young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. And even the infant will play near the hole of the cobra. And the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. And they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. What is this prophesying about? The new Jerusalem, we're not there yet. So it's in the time period of what? It's after tribulation. When is this? When is this time period? Millennial reign. This is not a trick question. This is the millennium that we're looking forward to. We're, look, we're listening for the shout, aren't we? We're listening for the trump of God to be blown. So those who are dead, who are righteous dead, will rise with Christ. And we who remain will not precede those who are dead, but we who are the body and bride will then be caught up. We will be harpazoed. We will be raptured out of here and transformed in the air into a glorified body. Then we go up into the marriage of the Lamb in heaven. All the while they're going under tribulation on the earth. We've studied this, guys. And then after that, when the millennial reign begins, is that not when the wolf and the lamb are going to lay down together? The ox and the lion are going to eat grass and a matter of fact, this has prompted a lot of authors and a lot of scholars to say, we are going to return to the original diets we were given in the Garden of Eden. Now, what was that? What? Did you say birds? No. Earth. And we call that kind of diet what? Vegetarians. Okay. <laughs> Because we're not feeding on one another. We're not feeding on flesh anymore. You know what? That's probably true because it talks about the fruit. What was in the Garden of Eden? Fruit. And so apparently this fruit has everything the body needs. And for the glorified body, that's all we're going to need. Okay. And so remember in chapter 9 of the book of Genesis, when Noah and his family landed, he said, before you know the dietary restrictions. But I'm now telling you, I'm putting fear and dread inside the animals and they're going to be scared of you. Because prior to that, the animals weren't scared of humans. But God put fear and dread in them. Why? Why did God put fear and dread in the animals when they landed off the ark into the new restructured earth? Because they're on the menu. Because oh. <laughs> animals were on the menu. Tim, do you hunt? Animals are on the menu. They're scared of you because you're going to kill them and then put them on a skewer and eat them. Okay? So there was fear and dread because God didn't want them just to come up and say, here, kill me and eat me. I'm sacrificing my body. Go ahead and have me. I'm really good and really tasty, especially if you put some barbecue sauce on his leg. But there's going to return to a day when even the viper will not be poisonous, so a child will not be bitten. We don't have to worry about those things. And as scared as, of vipers as my wife is, we don't have to worry about those things anymore. They will not pose harm. They will not pose risk. When is this time? That's not the tribulation. This is 
the millennial reign for a thousand years is what he's prophesying. And he says, there will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain. Because now who is king? Thank you. And he's ruling with a rod of iron as we talked about this morning. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. Now I want you to understand this knowledge doesn't mean a head knowledge. We can have head knowledge of the Lord right now and it not be heart knowledge. But this is a relational knowledge. This is a knowledge of a heartfelt understanding of who God is and how He is the King of all kings. Verse 10, In that day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. Now what's a banner do? It gets lifted up, doesn't it? All right. Banners get lifted up for all to see. And Christ said, if I be lifted up, I will, come on, draw how many men? All, all men. And that means just the Jew? It means from every tribe, every tongue, every kindred, every nation. If Christ be lifted up, there ain't, there ain't racism in it. It's from all nations. Gentile, Jew, we're all the same. Male or female makes no difference. I will draw all men. And so in that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner, raised and lifted up. For all the people of the nations will rally to him, and this place of rest will be glorious. He will draw all men to himself. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant. There it is. That is left of the people from Assyria. God always has a remnant. And he's going to bring them in from lower Egypt and from upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. Do you know who he's referring to? The diaspora. What does the diaspora mean? Who are the diaspora? You've heard this word before. When the Assyrians and the Babylonians came in and took over the northern kingdom, then eventually the southern kingdom, they dragged the Jews away from their homeland. Now, in Babylon, after 70 years, they began to return. The remnant return, right? You remember these stories? Mm -hmm. Okay, these are true stories. They were able to return. But those who were carted off to Assyria never got released to return. And so the Jews were scattered throughout the world. That's the diaspora. Okay? And as Paul speaks about the diaspora, these are those Hebrews who are scattered. They're not in their homeland. Remember the Hebrew... The Jew is always connected to the land, the promises of Abraham. Remember that. And so the Jew is not separate from the land. And so there still is a diaspora. They're out scattered. And there's some that are returning to Israel right now. But this is going to be a time where God says, once again, I will bring them back from the four corners of the earth, from every nation and every tribe that they've been dragged to, where they've remained. But I'm calling them home to the land. Okay? Because God's promises will always be fulfilled. This is prophecy going to be fulfilled. This is awesome. So wherever they're at, they're going to come back. And he will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. And he will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And Ephraim's jealousy will vanish, and Judah's enemies will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, nor Judah hostile towards Ephraim. Remember, northern and southern kingdoms. Remember how they were separated for so long? God said that separation is going to end. God's going to do this. And they will swoop down on the slopes of Felicia to the west. And together they will plunder the people to the east. And they will lay hands on Edom and Moab. And on the Ammonites, they will be subject to them. Now, who are those people? We've been studying them in the book of Judges. We've been studying them in Samuel. Who are these people? They have been those people who originally had the land that were supposed to be dispossessed. Remember when Ronnie was talking about Saul not doing what he was supposed to do? Would have had any problem with the, the Pezzarites had he wiped them out like he was told to. But meh, meh, the sheep and the cattle and the best of things, 
Saul decided to keep against God's word. If they would have wiped them out, the people, and not say, what? Well, surely you didn't really mean that, God. You didn't mean for... Yes, they had to contend with them. But God is saying, I'm going to handle them in the end. And they will be subject to, you will not be a slave ever, ever again. So your sworn enemies, once and for all, will be finally conquered. And God will do this. That's what that's saying. Up, Verse 15, this gets exciting. The Lord will dry up the gulf of the Egyptian sea. And with a scorching wind, he will sweep his hand over the Euphrates River. And it will break up into seven streams. So that men can cross over in sandals. There will be a highway. A holy highway for the remnant of his people that is left from Assyria, as there was for Israel when they came up from Egypt. Do you think God forgot about those people that got scattered? Do you think he forgot about the apple of his eye in other nations? He's never forgotten. He knows all the bloodlines. He knows all the lineage. And he says in Isaiah 19, let's go to 19.23. He says, uh, in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. And the Lord Almighty will bless them saying, blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. This is all millennial rain stuff. And again, Isaiah 51, verse 10. Let's tie in the back of Isaiah. 51, 10. Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made a road in the depths of the sea so that the redeemed might cross over? The ransomed of the Lord will return and they will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. I, even I, am he who comforts you. God has never forgotten about his people Israel. Some people are talking today that the church has replaced Israel. They're dingbats. That's not at all what the Bible says at all. God has never forgotten the Jew. They're still his chosen people. But we are the church. And we are under the covenant with Jesus Christ. The new covenant in his blood. But he still has a covenant with Israel, that they will occupy the land. And he will say he will even dry up the waters. You remember once before the Egyptians were killed when the Red Sea collapsed back upon them. God will dry that area up so that they will be able to walk on dry ground yet again back home. Because he's calling them home. So God has never, ever forgotten about the Jew, even though they may have forgotten about him. There's always a remnant. Don't you love Isaiah? He's talking about this remnant. We, we are so excited that there are those who still will hearken unto the voice of the Lord. Any questions about that? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, we're excited to see your prophecy be fulfilled. God, we know that your words are truth. And God, we shudder to think about the, the, the wrathfulness of God coming in the great tribulation. Help us, oh God, to, to be more of your workers out into your harvest field. God, that some more would come out of this darkness and be exposed to your glorious light so they don't have to go through these dark days ahead. But instead, they can have a joy of the Lord that passes all understanding because they have a knowledge of the Holy one of Israel, Kadosh Yisrael. They will understand who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And they will no longer think that they are master of their own destiny and it's all karma. But they will begin to understand there is a God above who loves them. A God who has sent His own Son to die for them. And that they just turn from their dark and wicked ways and return with fasting and weeping and mourning that Christ will take them in His arms and He will redeem them for eternity. And God help us to this end to see more get saved. To see more come into your kingdom. God to see the blind eyes open. The deaf ears be able to hear again. And hearts be rended before the God of Israel. God I ask for these things in Jesus name. Amen.